Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Learn to Love podcast, your guide to everything love, sex, intimacy, and relationships. Each week, your host, Zach Beach, interviews new experts on love, including couples therapists, relationship coaches, sex educators, and best-selling authors. Learn the best tips and cutting-edge wisdom to better love yourself, others, and the world. Thanks so much for joining us. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the Learn to Love podcast, everyone. I am your host, Zach Beach, and I'm here with the incredible psychologist and author, Dr. Bruce Chalmer. Hello, Bruce, and welcome to the show. Well, hello, Zach, and thanks for having me on. This is delightful. Today, we're going to be talking about seven words to jumpstart your love life. And for those that don't know, Dr. Bruce Charmer is a psychologist based in Vermont who has been working with couples for over 30 years. Through his teaching, consulting, writing, podcast, and videos about relationships, his ideas have helped thousands of couples and their therapists. Dr. Charmo is the author of It's Not About Communication, Why Everything You Know About Couples Therapy is Wrong, which we'll get to, and Reigniting the Spark, Why Stable Relationships Lose Intimacy and How to Get It Back, which was published in 2020. With his wife, educator Judy Alexander, Dr. Chalmer co-hosts the podcast Couples Therapy in Seven Words. How are you today, Bruce? I am well. Nice to be here and uh, nice to... I, I'm in Vermont, as, as we were talking about before. I see you're there in California, not the not necessarily the warm part, but it's, I'll bet it's warmer mm-hmm. than it is here right now. Yeah, nice to be with you uh, virtually. That's what I love so much about this show is just being able to connect with amazing individuals like you, no matter where they are in the world, and to have an audience all around the world. Mm-hmm. And I've learned so much from all of my guests, and I always look for straightforward, easy insight that people can apply to their life. And we don't beat around the bush in this podcast. So I'm going to ask you straight up, what are the seven words to jumpstart your love life? And and unlike most therapists, I can actually give you a straight answer to that question, <laughs> which, which is, here are the seven words, be kind, don't panic, and have faith. Hmm. You have to get, you have to count and to get seven words. Be kind, don't panic, <laughs> and have faith. It's three uh, principles, really, but seven's, you know, seven's a better number. Of course, I say seven words, uh, but of course, you need some explanation of what those seven words represent in order to understand how that can help you, you know, jumpstart your love life. And more generally, it's how it can help you do well in relationships. Hmm. Yeah, let's just unpack this. So when you say jumpstart your love life, is this targeted particularly to couples who their love is dead on arrival? <laughs> Uh, it's yes. I mean, certainly it is couples, the sort of people who consult me as a couples therapist, as I've so often commented to folks, nobody ever makes an appointment with me just to tell me how well everything is going. So (laughs) typically it is indeed directed at people who are having difficulty, you know, and love life is a very general term. I don't just mean sex life, although that's certainly included, but I mean, more generally intimate life, the the sense Mm -hmm. of connection that people have and so often when they are consulting a couples therapist, it's because that's the part that is missing. Mm-hmm. So be kind, don't panic, and have faith. And is that something I tell myself, I tell my partner, or is it something my therapist tells me? Well, certainly it's something you tell yourself. And of course, it's certainly something that I as a therapist lay out for folks as, as a guideline to think about. I would be very cautious about telling your partner anything about what they should do or how they should think because they tend to resist that (laughs) for good reason. (laughs) So indeed, you know, telling for me to point out to my wife or my wife to point out to me, if, especially if I'm upset or she's upset, um, well, this is how, this is how you should guide your thinking. It's probably, we're probably not real open to that at that moment. So it's really mostly for yourself. Mm. Um, but you know, I can, I can give you a little, um, history of where that where the seven words came from just to sort of put it in context sure. um, it originated way back when early in my practice I, I have been as you mentioned I've been in private practice for close the private practice close to 30 years and you know internships for a number of years before that and it was early in my private practice so I'm guessing yeah 25 ish years ago something like that 
uh, I was in a consultation group and one of my colleagues on the way out the door is one of those things like we're just about to leave. We're, we're walking out the door and he turns to me and he says, how do you do couples therapy anyway? You know, realizing it's kind of a silly question. And mm-hmm. I stopped and I thought about it. You know, how could I summarize that? And I said, you know, I, I've thought about this. I suppose what I tell people, if you boil all down all the stuff that we do, uh, what am I in, in effect telling people? It's be kind and don't panic. and mm-hmm. That's five words, of course. Um, and then it was some time later, I gave that some thought and I realized, well, there's a logic to it, of course. Be kind. And when I say kind, I don't just mean be nice to you know, to each other. I mean, that's a good idea. We should all be nice to each other. But I mean be kind in the sense of recognizing kinship. So be recognize your kinship with this person that you are partnered with. Because we treat our kin, even though we, we're not always nice to our kin, I get that. But we think of our kin differently from how we think of people who are not kin. We tend to ascribe um, better motivations to them than we might to someone we don't know or someone we don't consider you know, kin with. So mm-hmm. how do you manage to be kin if you're in a panic? Well, you really can't. You know, When you get into a certain level of panic, it's all about fight or flight or freeze, and that is not conducive to being kind. So the, mm-hmm. the logic there is, well, don't panic so you can be kind. It, you know, when I thought about all the stuff I'd been trained in that, you know, therapists do with folks, you could say a lot of what we do with people is essentially teach them ways to not panic, teach them how to regulate their emotions so they're not freaking out. And that, of course, so there's, there's the five words, be kind and don't panic. But then, of course, people would ask, well, that sounds, you know, that sounds useful, but how the heck am I supposed to not panic? And Mm -hmm. this is the part where I don't have a simple answer to that. But what I did notice, if I thought about the folks I work with who seem to be able to handle the really hard stuff without panicking. And when Mm. I say the really hard stuff, I'm thinking, you know, they come in, there's been infidelity. They're just, somebody's really hurt and somebody's feeling guilty and they're just, they're just a mess. And the folks that can handle that kind of really hard stuff without getting into panic are the ones who are manifesting what I call faith. And by faith, I don't necessarily mean religious faith at all, although sometimes it's consistent with religious faith, but sometimes it isn't. By faith, what I mean is that fundamental sense that life is meaningful, which is to say reality is right to be what it is. People who have that sort of mindset, it's like, okay, this was awful that happened to us, but there's a basis for it we need to understand. Those are the Mm. folks who could do okay. And the people who would just come in and say, just make it stop and we we have to go back to the way it was, they're not showing faith. They're just saying we we have to not, we have to unknow this and it doesn't work. And Mm. those are the ones who would be more in a panic. So, you know, when I say have faith, it's really, it's more of a description than a prescription. It's like, Mm. well, when you have faith, then that's when you're not panicking. Mm. So it's about finding a way to practice that mindset of faith. So to summarize, what I'm hearing is being kind means recognizing kinship. Don't panic means regulate your emotions. And having mm-hmm. faith means understanding things are the way that they're supposed to be. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and that they're right to be that way. That it's they're supposed to be in that sense. You know, it's not merely accepting reality, which of course is important. You know, mm-hmm. it's accepting, but you can accept reality in, in a state of sort of dreary resignation. And this isn't dreary resignation. This is like, well, okay, this is what we got to deal with. Somehow, even though I don't know how, somehow we're all equipped to deal with it somehow. And mm. yes, we all die at the end, but we're all equipped to live. Mm. And so, you know, you do the best you can with that. That's just what I mean by a mindset. So I'd really love to get into each of these three principles. The one that's calling to me right now is this emotional regulation part, is this panic part. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering if you could tell us more about why this panic happens in relationships. Mm. I think we all say want to be kind, we want to be loving, Mm. and are often surprised at how quickly we get triggered, sometimes even surprised at our own defensiveness. We don't think of our relationship as being a source of, of panic, but what is the cause of the panic, and what do people even usually panic about? Mm, yeah, yeah, great questions. I mean, it is indeed interesting that, as you said, we don't usually, we certainly don't want to think of our relationships as a cause of panic. And yet, 
if you think about it, well, I mean, why do we panic at all? You know, in, in evolutionary terms, we are the descendants of folks who panic too much rather than too little. You know, mm. nature errs on the side of panicking too much rather than too little. It's if you see the saber toothed tiger for the second time, having survived one encounter, that's no time to stand there and say, oh, what an interesting saber toothed tiger. I wonder what its habits are. You know, that's the time to panic. That's <laughs> the time to run like crazy or fight like crazy if you have to, or whatever. So we have panic for very good reason. We develop relationships. And the interesting thing about our closest, most deep, our deepest relationships is they turn out to be the source of panic, not because the other person's trying to upset you or trying to hurt you, but because they're so capable of hurting you simply by being so important. So, mm. you know, my, my, my wife and me, me to her and she to I, that idea of how you are to your main partner is potentially dangerous precisely because they're so important to you. Mm. If, she's, if my wife is angry with me, that can feel like an existential threat. It isn't. She's not a violent person. She's never <laughs> attacked me violently and never would, I can't imagine. And mm. yet it feels like an existential threat to my neocortex, which is always, you know, thinking ahead and worrying myself into a tizzy because that's what human beings are capable of doing. So it is that interesting paradox that the people who are the most important to you are also the source sometimes of potential panic. Mm -hmm. And they don't have to do much. All they have to do is seem to be, uh, seem to disconnect from you. And that can be panic inducing or anxiety inducing. I, I, I think mm -hmm. I overuse the word panic. I don't mean it in the necessarily in the full clinical sense, but it's that feeling that you know what happens when bunches of your brain parts shut down, which is what happens when you get into a fight or flight sort of panic, mm -hmm. and you can't think. And that's you know, as you were pointing out. I mean, that's when people <laughs> behave in ways they wouldn't have thought they would behave mm. because they're on a panic. So you know what we panic about is potential loss of relationship. So what does the not panicking look like? What does the emotional regulation look like? What are the skills that we develop so that this almost leftover vestige of evolutionary patterning doesn't come up so much in our relationships? You know, that's uh, that's where probably the weakest part of my little patter here is you know, I fall back on saying, well, if you have faith, that's when you're not panicking. But what, all right, how do you do that? You know, I don't have a simple formula for it. What I observe is that when people practice that and get, get good enough at it, that's when they can tolerate that anxiety. And that, that is another one of my favorite little, um, and I of course didn't invent these terms, but one of my favorite little phrases is tolerate the anxiety rather than avoid it. Mm. That, that's what it looks like. It's not like you don't feel the anxiety. Of course you feel the anxiety. It's that you tolerate it so that you can feel it, but not reach that point where, you know, whole sections of your brain shut down. Mm -hmm. And I realized I sort of wiggled away from your question. It's like, well, how do you do that? You know, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> what is that? And that's, you know, damn if I know, you know, I mean, uh -huh. I, I, I know it when I see it and you probably do too, you know, but mm -hmm. how do you manage to get there? It, I think there's an element, the best one I've got, and, it, it, and I think it's still pretty weak. And I invite your listeners to Come up with better answers than I, than I did for this. The mm. best one I've got is practice. It is that faith is not a, it's not a knowledge. You know what I mean? It's not like, oh, I can, I can convince you, here are the facts and that'll convince you to have faith. It isn't that at all. It's not mm -hmm. a scientific statement. It's not like data will convince you to have faith because it's mm -hmm. a value judgment. So it's a practice. And if you practice that, and how do you learn skills to practice? One way is you know, get yourself around people who can teach you by, by example often. So sometimes people learn faith from, if they're fortunate, from their parents or from, you know, other formative teachers in their childhoods. Sometimes they learn it from therapists, although it's interesting because therapists can manifest faith, but also therapists can not manifest faith and just sort of pathologize everything. Well, the practice of mindfulness kind of comes up for me when I do think of that self-regulation or just being able to notice our reactive patterns without getting so caught up in them in order to just respond yeah. from a place of, of love and compassion. And that's a practice mm -hmm. too. That absolutely is. And indeed, you'd think that would come to my mind sooner because I have practiced that and I've also taught it to folks as well. It's, it's interesting. I suppose I figure with respect to th things like mindfulness practice, the, the trick with mindfulness practice, I think, 
is you have to have some faith to give it a shot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? You have to believe it's possible mm -hmm. uh, in order to persevere, to develop those skills. Mm -hmm. And so he's like, well, how do you, <laughs> how do you convince somebody to try mindfulness if they won't? You know, it's kind of tricky. It's like, well, you, you sort of have to believe it's possible and then, then you'll be halfway there. So moving on from this, not panicking, because um, we'll have to practice on that and think about it and mull it over. <laughs> Let's talk about this idea of being kind, mm -hmm. because you mentioned it's not necessarily just doing nice things, but recognizing a certain kinship. Yeah. And I want to challenge you just a little bit, because that doesn't sound very sexy when I'm thinking of my, <laughs> thinking of my partner as my kin. So tell, uh -huh. us, tell us more about that. Yeah, I, yeah, I'd be happy to. You know, in terms of it being sexy, it's, you know, I just read Jack Morin's book, The Erotic Mind. Do you know the book? Yep. It's it's a classic and it's one of those books, it's, and maybe you have things like this too, you know, it's one of those books I've been meaning to read for about 20 years. Mm. And I finally, because I keep seeing it quoted, and I keep reading about it. And of course, he points out what you said in, in effect as well. It's like, yeah, if if all you have, not to say that this is small, but if what you have with someone is that kind of kinship, then to feel sexy about them feels incestuous. Mm -hmm. There's something about it that feels like, ooh, wait a minute, that's aren't those supposed to be two separate domains? And of course, the the trick in a monogamous relationship, certainly, and I think in any like uh, primary sort of relationship, is that you be able to simultaneously see someone as an object, you know, a sex object, someone you can lust after. And also see them as a, a soul that you can connect to, with, which implies, of course, respect and kinship and all of that. Kinship belongs to the domain more of, um, well, I was going to say more of stability than of intimacy. That's another distinction I like to make between stability and intimacy. We need them mm -hmm. both. Although I think, as I think about it, I think kinship also involves a degree of intimacy as well. On the stability side of things, that's where it doesn't seem very sexy, but it's also it turns out to be really important. Also, mm -hmm. that sense that okay, I can count on you. It's predictable. I don't. You're not going to cause me a lot of anxiety. Mm -hmm. That's that sense of uh, kinship as well. Mm -hmm. That you're someone who's I know is on my team, and even if things are a little rough, we're okay because we have this basis of, you know, we have nice roots in our relationship that are holding us in place. That isn't very sexy, mm -hmm. but it's really important to not freaking out. And, you know, what Morin points out, and I, I've always said this as well, anxiety itself can be both sexy and anti-sexy. Uh, there's an element of, um, you know, when, when people are just totally freaking out, it tends to shut them down erotically. Mm -hmm. But when there is an element of uncertainty and an element uh, of yeah. what, what Morin talks about as obstacles, that can be very sexy. And so that idea that, yeah, you're a little anxious about how your partner is going to be with you, that can actually be stimulating. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of, I suppose, in terms of kinship, you know, for me to feel that my wife is kin is not the same thing as feeling like, well, she's just an extension of myself and that's not at all sexy. Mm. I need to feel the sense of, well, she's also other in lots of really interesting ways. Yeah, is that the book with the erotic equation that yep, that's desire the <laughs> plus obstacles equals attraction, I think? No, it's, it's attraction plus obstacles equals excitement. Uh, you got the idea, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, attraction plus obstacles. Yeah, and uh, the obstacles are, are necessary, it turns out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just even thinking about the concept of, you know, you're not trying to merely give a lover everything they want you're trying or or just get from your lover everything you want there needs to be some uncertainty there and even things like anticipation and longing that's what more counts as obstacle mm. it's like there needs to be that sense of not quite sure how this is going to go and that really stimulates the erotic charge so i'm almost hearing from you that we all we do need to cultivate both sides of this equation both the connection closeness and safety that comes with relationships while simultaneously that uncertainty and obstacles that do help bring a level of excitement into the relationship. Yes, that is exactly it. Yeah, I have whole sections in, in actually both of, the, both of my books that talk about that distinction between, again, the words I use, different people use different words, but the words I use are stability and intimacy. Mm. And the, that indeed we need to cultivate both. And you know, when you have a relationship that is all stability, but intimacy is gone. And, and look, the, the way that happens 
with stable relationships often is because stability is so important, especially when people do things like get married and have children. Mm -hmm. You know, having kids really ups the ante in terms of the importance of stability, which I think, you know, for very good reason. When that happens, they will tend to avoid rocking the boat often. Mm. And that's fine, except that that often means, you know, rocking the boat can mean something like complaining about something, a garden variety complaint. And if those things don't get expressed, that can raise resentments and things like that. But it also means things like talking about your dreams, talking about things that you've wondered about and you're not sure how your partner feels about it. Again, be it, you know, sexually or just in the domain of general living. Mm. Those things, when they get suppressed, people lose that sense of, of erotic connection mm -hmm. and or intimacy in general. And that becomes destabilizing. That's, the, that's what brings a lot of people to my office. Mm -hmm. More than the other way around. Of course, the other way around, there is such a thing as intimacy without stability. For example, affairs in monogamous relationships. Affairs are intimacy without stability. There's zero stability. The intimacy can be really powerful because it's so dangerous, mm -hmm. but it rarely, I don't want to say never, but it rarely works out for someone to leave their spouse for an affair partner. I, I know folks where it did work out, but they're the exception because they didn't have any sense of stability. So I love your distinction between stability and intimacy and how we do need to cultivate different skills in order to bring more of these things into our relationships. And I'm curious more about those skills for intimacy that you recommend for your clients. Yeah. You know, the overall chief skill of intimacy is to tolerate anxiety rather than freak out about it. Mm. And again, that's a very general statement, you know, tolerate anxiety. Things like mindfulness can be helpful for that. Anything that helps you not freak out can be helpful for that. Hmm. But that's another thing I think just requires practice all on its own. You know, mindfulness is great for learning how to reduce and you know manage anxiety. Um, but I think in terms of tolerating the anxiety of intimacy, it involves trying stuff that you're uncomfortable with. Hmm. You know, being willing to, you know, entertain possibilities that you hadn't maybe entertained before. Hmm. And again, I, I never suggest that people should do something again, especially sexually, that they should do something they find utterly repugnant, but that they be open to ideas that maybe they hadn't considered. That's what that's about. And that sort of willingness is what keeps a long, can keep a long-term relationship very sexy, very passionate mm. because you're, it, it's always new on some level, you know, you both parties are open to learning and open to, you know, we all, we all encounter ideas we hadn't thought of before. And to be willing to try out stuff is, as I say, that keeps things feeling uh, alive. Mm. So I'm hearing your emphasis on noticing our emotions without getting so caught up in them, tolerating our anxiety rather than freaking out about it. And you have brought up an affair as an example. And I am wondering about those situations and relationships that do seem to warrant uh, a rather intense emotional reaction. Like my partner has gambled away all of my finances or they, yes, the revealing of an affair for many years. Um, yeah. And I feel like that, you know, freaking out to a certain extent is somewhat justified in these cases. Oh my God. Yes. Of course. <laughs> I, it, it's on some level, it's always justified. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. In other words, we are, we, I, I, that's another element of what I call faith. You know, it's like, well, we're all valid to be who we are. And look, I don't want to overstate that. We're all valid to be who we are. I don't mean to say that, oh, then anything goes and nobody should ever be condemned for anything. No, mm -hmm. of course not. We, we still have to have a moral sense and, and are responsible for what we do. But I will note that if, exactly as you said, that's often where I'm starting with, with a couple where there's been a revelation such as you described. There's been a fair, there's been, yes, my partner gambled away all of our money, or my partner has a, an addiction I wasn't aware of, uh, which could be to any of a variety of substances or a variety of behaviors or whatever that might be. Uh, those things are shocking. And often the reaction on the part of the partner who finds out about it is indeed panic. Mm -hmm. And that's just natural. And of course, that, that's what's going to be happening. Once they get past that initial shock, the work involves finding meaning even in the awful stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying finding justification, 
but I'm saying, okay, so, you know, your partner gambled away all of the finances. That's, that's an awful situation. And you're, you know, you're reeling from the revelation. Once you've got past that, if you want to maintain a relationship with that person, then you need to be able to find a way of understanding, you know, you, you're going to need to understand that there was a basis for it that has now changed so you can trust it won't happen again. Mm -hmm. Or alternatively, sometimes when I say if you're going to maintain a relationship, sometimes you don't have an option because, you know, you might divorce, but your parents are the same children, for example. So you're going to have a relationship with a person, whether it's still a partner relationship or not. Mm -hmm. And even to be able to decide that involves getting hold of yourself enough so that you can find the meaning of what went on so you can understand it better. Mm -hmm. You know, understanding the context, which is requires a lot of tolerance of anxiety. It's hard work. Mm. So the one topic we haven't talked too much about is this idea of faith. And you've mentioned mm -hmm. not necessarily faith in some almighty power, but almost mm -hmm. uh, what I'm hearing from you is more of like a faith in the universe or a faith that everything will turn out okay. Tell us more about this faith. Yeah. Let me say, I have no problem with using religious language with religious clients. Uh, it's not like my definition of faith is mutually exclusive with, let's say, a Western religion, you know, monotheistic religion. You know, I'm Jewish uh, and I'm actively Jewish. I'm not at all fundamentalist in my practice, but I'm very active in the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. uh, for that reason, oddly enough, living in Vermont, where there's a very small Jewish community, um, the vast majority of people I work with are not Jewish, precisely because potential clients who are Jewish, I'm very likely to know. <laughs> it's a small Jewish community, and I'm very active in it. So that means the vast majority of the folks I work with who are religious are Christian, occasionally Muslim, but almost almost always Christian around here. Vermont is not a very religious state, as it turns out, in terms of religious practice, but there are plenty of folks who are quite religiously active. And I have no difficulty talking about my notion of faith as quite consistent with religious faith, as long as it isn't fundamentalist. I'll come back to that in a second. But a religious faith that would say, well, whatever God means, God is good. So I don't have any trouble with God language. A lot of folks do because they think of God. <laughs> it's funny, from a Jewish perspective, a lot of folks think of God that they were thinking about when they were you know, 12 or 13, which is the last time they said foot in synagogue because they did a bar bar mitzvah and then they were done. You know? So <laughs> mm -hmm. it depends on... Uh, if you have a sort of juvenile view of the notion of God, then it is kind of limiting for a grown up. But if you don't necessarily have that notion, to say that reality is right to be what it is, in my mind, is equivalent. If you're if you are religious and want to use God language, it's like saying, "Well, God is good. Whatever God means, God is good. Things are right to be what they are, even when they seem painful to us. Not seem, even when they are painful to us. There's a rightness about it. Doesn't necessarily mean everything turns out okay from my personal perspective. Do you know what I mean? I mean, ultimately, the way things turn out from my personal perspective is that I die. You know, that's that's the to be able to appreciate the beauty of life, even as I recognize that it's finite, is part of faith for me. You know, part mm -hmm. of the big reality is no matter how hard I try to get it right, I still die. And that's kind of beautiful as well as terrifying. And I suppose the faith part would say it's beautiful. Mm. The panic part would say it's terrifying. Mm. The one thing I would exclude from, in terms of religious uh, practice, uh, that I would exclude from my definition of faith is fundamentalism in the sense that people will say, well, we know exactly what the truth is, and it's the only truth, and anybody else's description of it is wrong and needs to be opposed. That sort of ideological understanding of truth, that is the opposite of faith from my perspective. To me, again, from a from a Jewish perspective, to me, that sounds like idolatry. In other words, it sounds like elevating some human construction and calling it God, mm. which is the opposite of faith from my perspective. So I, I do exclude that sense of, you know, people who say, well, there's only one way of understanding any of this and you have to use our particular descriptions or else you're, you're wrong and consigned to hell. Mm. Um, that to me is not faith at all. Mm. But I will say I've known folks who are members of fundamentalist churches who nevertheless seem to me to manifest faith the way I describe it. They're, you know, those are the folks who, yes, they're fundamentalists, but then when they find out their son is gay, accept him anyway. Mm. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> that's to me, that's a, that's an act of faith. Well, I would love to get more into this idea of the spiritual idea of love and when it falls flat or when a person doesn't experience it 
that way from institutionalized religion. Mm. Because on the one hand, I do think the thing uniting all religions is this basic idea of another power that has a love and compassion that we can learn from, or simply that mm -hmm. love and compassion unite us all. And to many people, that's not what they experience from certain uh, institutionalized and Abrahamic religions, which seem to be less about uh, love and more about bigotry. Curious your thoughts about that. Yeah, that's, and the bigotry aspect is, uh, that's what I would, I'm, I'm probably being unfair in, in equating that to some degree with fundamentalism, but I sort of do equate that. You know, that's what, that sort of fundamentalist view is what fosters bigotry. That sense that, well, I know the truth and anything you're saying that is not that is wrong. And, you know, to me, that fosters bigotry. As opposed to people who say, well, I am a committed Christian and that's how I see the world. And, you know, and I, I wish you were too, because I think you'd be better off. But that doesn't necessarily mean bigotry. It could mean, well, I understand there's other ways of viewing things. You know? What is love in a more spiritual sense to you? Or even what does the love of God look like? I don't know a simple way to, you know, to summarize that. Uh, it has something to do with that. I, again, I'll use that word humility again, the sort of recognition that whatever God is, I'm not God. That's that's something that 12-step uh, folks will talk about a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, people in 12-step programs, they'll say, well, the higher power thing, they don't at all want to specify what they mean by that because they don't want to limit it to any particular religious understanding. Mm -hmm. But they will say, the one thing about the higher power is it's not me. <laughs> so that there is, you know, the things are way bigger than I am. It's that feeling. And so the sense that we're all accepted in that, that's the love part that we are all valid to be who we are, that we, mm -hmm. you know, in a religious sense, we're all God's children, that we are all um, valid to be the people that we are. And when we encounter differences among people, which of course we encounter, it's just a fascinating part of being human, that rather than saying, oh my God, you're wrong to be what you are or who you are, mm -hmm. to say, wow, I better broaden my perspective to understand that you know, things I thought were true turn out not to be true. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. You know, I thought there were only two genders. It turns out, oh, actually, people experience themselves in lots of different ways. Isn't that interesting? You know, mm -hmm. as opposed to we have to make sure that, you know, that idea is stamped out. I do love that distinction that we are all valid to be who we are, which I feel like is the fundamental thing that most marginalized people are asking for, whether you're gay mm -hmm. or trans or even, let's say, a woman walking into an abortion clinic, this basic idea that my choices for myself, my identity of who I am, is valid and even perhaps loved mm -hmm. in the eyes of God. Is there any way to <laughs> convert? <laughs> is there any way to <laughs> uh, bridge that gap for those that say, you know, no, what you are doing is wrong. My book, my yeah. deity says that it's wrong, and I'm going to tell you that it's wrong and make yeah. comments, laws, actions to prevent you from being uh, the valid person that you are. Yeah. Yeah. Abortion is a great example of that. And I'll tell you what, what I mean by that. Cause you're saying, you know, yeah. How do you, how do you talk people into the other side? You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And you sort of can't, first of all, I mean, you know, you can't talk people into the other side. What you can do is understand the living hell out of them. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And of course the, the trouble, trouble with that is, if I set about to understand the other, whatever the other side is, whatever side I'm on, and, you know, in these big polarizing issues, and abortion is a great example of that. It's like you can either be in favor of allowing it or disallowing it. You know, it's sort of hard. And, yeah, you know, there are various gray areas in between, but I have to be able to respect people who say, look, I'm a, you know, we're the, the, I'm, I happen to be on the side of people who think that a woman should have the ability to get a, a safe and legal abortion. There are folks, of course, who feel otherwise. Mm -hmm. I can write them off as religious zealots and fundamentalists, but it turns out I know folks who are neither, who nevertheless would say it shouldn't be allowed. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't be allowed for reasons X, Y, and Z that they will then say, which I have to recognize as not crazy reasons. They're just <laughs> different. They're making different assumptions about what degree of personal freedom there ought to be. You know, abortion's a great one in the sense of, um, and I have to put my, you know, I'm not a rabbi. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a rabbi, but I played one on television. I never really played one on television either. <laughs> I used to lead services a lot in a little community. So <laughs> for those listening, those Jewish listeners listening, thinking, 
where is he giving rabbinic opinions? I'm not giving rabbinic opinions. I am noting that my understanding of Orthodox Judaism, I'm not talking about the more liberal movement. My understanding of Orthodox Judaism's view of abortion is that there are some circumstances where not only is abortion allowed, it's actually mandated. In, in Orthodox law, there's no such thing as a right to choose. It has nothing whatever to do with rights. They will say, no, no, this isn't about your rights. This is about saving the woman's life as opposed to the baby's. If there's a choice, we have to choose the woman. Mm -hmm. That is a, that's a religious requirement on, of, of Orthodox Judaism. And so the, that flies in the face of a also principled view that would say, well, if a, you know, a fertilized egg is, we, we now consider a full human being, then we can't choose to murder even to save someone else's life. Mm -hmm. And I respect that view. I happen to disagree with it strongly, but I understand it. It's not a crazy view. Mm -hmm. It's a view based on a, a, a particular, not all Christians, but a particular Christian understanding of when life begins. And they're saying, well, you can't kill somebody. And, you know, Jewish law would say you can't kill somebody. Well, actually, Jewish law would say you can kill somebody to save your own life. Actually, you, in fact, you, you're mandated to if you have to. Mm. You, you're required to. But other people would say, no, rather than kill someone else, I would let, you know, I'd let myself die. Those people, I guess, would be pacifists. You know? mm. So just saying that, you know, I, there's no way to convert folks from something that isn't crazy. And there's no way to convert folks from something that is crazy because they're crazy. Mm -hmm. right? So it isn't about converting. It's actually about bridging the gap and trying to understand. And then the, mm. that's a talk about raising anxiety. If I start trying to understand how somebody who believes something very you know, radically different from what I believe, I start really trying to understand what they're thinking, I run the risk of changing my mind. So <laughs> the, I have to tolerate that anxiety to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a lot of the, the awful polarization we see in our culture has to do with people, oddly enough, avoiding the anxiety of opening their minds to somebody else's ideas. Mm. You know, conspiracy theories are all about that. If you have a conspiracy theory and you just lock yourself into it, it means that nothing will shake you from your, you know, your very comfortable understanding. And you can just yell and scream about the other side, but you don't actually have to think about it. I want to bring this conversation a little bit into the therapist's office when you mm -hmm. talk about you can't change somebody's deep-rooted beliefs in these things, but you can understand them. And I imagine there's many situations where a person has perhaps a negative belief, perhaps a negative mm -hmm. pattern. Even in the world of psychology, there's, somebody might walk in and, and have certain delusions or paranoia about the world. And mm -hmm. if you just tell them that like they're experiencing delusion, <laughs> of course, they're going to be resistant. You're wrong. <laughs> just as if I were to tell my yeah. partner that they have a temper, Mm -hmm. that they would, they would refuse it or somebody walks into your office saying they think they're god or the next manifestation of christ and you tell them uh -huh. no that's not true they're gonna have that same resistance so yeah what's the path towards guiding people to a more realistic a more life-serving a more love-serving frame of reference Mm, yeah, no, yeah, great question. Let me note that when I say you can't convert someone, I don't mean that they can't change. Right. And, and that's really important in a therapist's office too. I'm not there to change people or cure people or fix people. I am there to work with people. And that does indeed produce change. And it's interesting because it produces change in them and also in me. You know, it's like, yeah, we are there to follow the meaning. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, that's a very faith-based idea. It's like, we're going to, there's something meaningful happening here. If somebody comes in now, I, I have to say in, in the kind of work I do, I do, I've encountered very, very few people who are psychotic occasionally, rarely though, in the kind of practice that I do. But even then there's a basis for their beliefs. It doesn't happen to be scientifically accurate or journalistically accurate. Mm -hmm. But there's a basis for people's beliefs that if you can explore with them, sometimes there's, mm -hmm. there's room for maneuvering. You know what a, a better example, I think, is folks who were abused as children will often think of themselves as fundamentally flawed. You know, I'm not sure what, the, what your, uh, what your ling language rating is for this. Can I say pieces of shit? Mm -hmm. <laughs> is that okay to say? Mm -hmm. They're, they will often think of themselves as just fundamentally pieces of shit. Because that's what they learned early on. 
And I can sit there and really mean and really say, oh my God, no, you are a, you know, you're a valuable human being. I can say that all I want, but in doing that, I'm just arguing with them. I'm ignoring something that's been important to them. And then you come to realize that the reason why when people are abused as young children, they tend to adopt that is because it's better than the alternative that they faced at that time. Mm. If they're the people who are caring for them are hurting them horribly. And, you know, the people who are supposed to be taking care of them and protecting them from danger are actually the source of, of hurting them. Either, you know, I, I'm sure I'm oversimplifying. They're not thinking of it in these terms, but basically they have two choices. Either they will think the world is impossibly horrible, completely out of control, and all they can expect is horrible pain, mm-hmm. or they can think, I deserve this, so I, at least mm-hmm. I have some control over it. Mm-hmm. And so that's what they come to believe in. It becomes to be their truth. You can't argue with that truth, but you can understand it and recognize it. And when you do, that's when it becomes possible for people to say, oh, I don't need that now. There are other ways that it's, it's possible to be. And you see the same thing in a, in a couple. But if you're, if you're arguing with a couple about how they should view each other, it doesn't tend to get you anywhere. If you recognize there's, they're both valid people, if they have, a, they have a basis for how they feel, even though, of course, it's inaccurate. We're always inaccurate. Mm-hmm. You know, we're not, we are not primarily rational beings. Mm-hmm. It, you know, Jill Bolte Taylor, the, um, the neuroscientist who had a stroke, mm-hmm. she's, yeah. uh, she did, anyway, she, one of her, she's written two books and her more recent book is called Whole Brain Living. She talks about, we're all multiple people. Mm-hmm. And one of the things she points out is we are not um, thinking creatures who feel, we are feeling creatures who think. You know, thinking is kind of a, an afterthought, mm-hmm. so to speak. Um, we we feel what we feel, and we there's a basis for it. Again, maybe the basis is, is psychosis, but mostly it's not. Mm. You know, mostly the folks I work with, vast majority, there's nothing wrong with their brains. They're forming these opinions, even if they're unfair and unproductive. They're forming them from something, mm-hmm. and when you can follow that meaning and work with it. With a you know that requires faith. It requires some courage to look into things that are painful. That's when sh- that's when things shift. Yeah, I love that. One metaphor is probably quite imperfect that's coming up for me is almost like we have certain beliefs and it's like a house and we look at our house and we're like, this is great. And then you're like, yes, but what about this beam that is supporting this house? And <laughs> and you're like, well, actually, that seems just like, yeah, that doesn't, that's not necessarily the right one. So whether, you know, so I think I'm worthless, for example, and it's like, huh, interesting house you have here what about this beam that like is this just a message you received from you know your parents and it was a coping mechanism and they're like huh yeah and then eventually you dismantle it over here and then kind of build something mm-hmm. else up over here well and, and you know if you watch hgtv which <laughs> is the, <laughs> the kind of thing that it it, it, it sort of has become I, I i suppose i shouldn't call it a guilty pleasure because there's nothing guilty about it but it is kind of brainless you know mm-hmm. and, and you watch it and you realize yeah before they take down that beam they've got to set up some other structures to hold that house up so that when they take that beam down the whole thing doesn't come falling down you know before you can just dismantle that beam you've got to have some other structures in place mm, yeah so as we're winding down i do want to get into real quick the one of your books, which says it's not about communication, why everything you know Mm. about couples therapy is wrong. We don't have too much time. I just want to know (laughs) if it's not about communication, what is it about? (laughs) I think a seat of the pants guess I did is about two thirds of the couples who come to see me say, we need to communicate better. Can you give us some rules for communicating? Can we learn active listening? Can we learn to use I statements? Can we learn nonviolent communication? I don't mean to say those things cynically. Those are all you know useful things. Mm-hmm. But the interesting thing is the vast, vast majority of people I work with are already communicating very clearly. The problem is not how they're communicating. The problem is what they're communicating. They don't need to learn rules for how to communicate. They're, cu- they're clearly communicating things like anger and mistrust and disrespect. Mm-hmm. That's the problem. It's not that they, it's not, their problem isn't communication. The problem is what they're communicating. So what's it about? It's about actually what you're communicating, which is if you, in fact, disrespect your partner, you're going to convey that even if you try and dress it up in all kinds of, you know, clever statements, Mm -hmm. it's still going to come through as disrespect. I I gave an example in the book, which I just, one of my favorite examples, it just happened within the last years actually was, I was already mostly through the book and added it because it was such a great example. 
the couple I was working with where we talked about some of these issues and the, they came back uh, after, I think it was about the fourth or fifth session, they came back. They were both smiling and the guy said, you know, I thought more about that stuff and I realized, oh my God, I do think she's a moron. <laughs> and, you know, and I'm looking and he's, he's smiling and she's smiling, realize she's smiling. That's an important part of it. And he's saying, I said, well, what do you mean by that? He said, well, of course, I don't really think she's a moron, but I realize all these times when I've been talking to her, in the back of my mind, I've just been assuming I know better than she does about everything. Mm. And I'm realizing I actually uh, don't know better than she does about everything. Mm -hmm. And she's smiling, not only because he's recognized, oh, no wonder she's been offended by how he's talked to her because, you know, he means well, but he really did think he knew better than she did about everything. Mm. She's smiling because she said, yeah, and you know, the trouble was I agreed with him. I thought I was a moron too. Mm. Because she absorbed that too. And of course, they both knew that wasn't true. They both knew they're both intelligent and, you know, competent people. And that realization itself changed how they communicate. Of course it did, because the problem wasn't how they communicated. The problem was what he was communicating. He was saying, you know, you're I disrespect you and I know better than you do. So why don't you do it my way? And re as a, as opposed to saying what he could then say was, you know, I, I do respect you and you, I, I think we have different views of this. I would prefer this. What do you think? And then they can go ahead and have an agreement or a disagreement. I also want to comment on the subtitle of the book, which is flat out ridiculous, isn't it? Why everything you know mm -hmm. about couples therapy is wrong, you know? Um, and I mean that I've, it's one of those provocative subtitles. Mm -hmm. I will give a spoiler alert here, which is to point out, because it, it turns out that subtitle is one of the main ideas of the book. The spoiler alert is in the last chapter of the book, I say, incidentally, it's not just you. Everything I know about couples therapy is wrong too. Mm -hmm. The point being the issue isn't what you know. The issue is the knowing. To claim that I know what's going to be better for a couple is, is first of all, it's arrogant. And secondly, it's ineffective. And that's true of people who, you know, when you claim you know what's going on already, that shuts down exploration. Mm. And so uh, one of the main ideas of the book is, you know, ideas are great. Ideology is a problem. And when you apply ideology in the therapeutic domain, it causes harm. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Bruce Chalmer, for coming on to the show. I do have to finish by asking you a question I ask all of my guests, which is, what do you wish everyone knew about love? Yeah, I mean, I can I can boil that down two ways. One is just to fall back on my seven words: be kind, don't panic, and have faith. <laughs> the other, though, more a little more directly, is what I wish everybody knew about love was that it requires tolerating anxiety. That idea, I think that's crucial to being okay in a love relationship. What about those who suffer from anxiety or think they suffer from anxiety? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And look, everybody does to some extent. It's a necessary capability. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I don't mean to be un, you know, unempathic for people who don't. No, there's some people a lot more than others. And indeed, that's their challenge. I will note something, though. Folks who are habitually anxious, it's surprising. Put them in a situation that is genuinely dangerous, and they will often respond not always, by the way, mm -hmm. but they will often respond astonishingly well. It's like, I remember folks who basically said, then all of a sudden the car went off the bridge and obviously they lived to tell the tale, right? And they were thinking, oh, they were just calm. It's, it's almost like they'd been practicing for this their whole lives. You know, mm -hmm. they, they knew how to panic really well, so they didn't have to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even folks who are very anxious can learn to tolerate anxiety. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Bruce Chalmer. You clearly have a wealth of experience, and I appreciate you sharing all your wisdom with our listeners today. For our listeners who want to learn more about you, how can they find you? They can find my uh, my own website, brucechalmer.com. Uh, that'll have information about my books, also information about my practices there. And if they are interested in the um, podcast that I do with my wife, Judy Alexander, it's called Couples Therapy in Seven Words. You can go to ctin7, that's the number seven, ctin7.com, CT for couples therapy, ctin7.com, and that will give you uh, access to all of our episodes and information about us and our podcast. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. The author of It's Not About Communication, Why Everything You Know About Couples Therapy is Wrong. Thank you so much, Dr. Chalmer, for coming on to the show. And thank you, listeners, for listening to the show. We hope you remember all the valuable lessons that Bruce shared with us today, including be kind, don't panic, have faith, 
Being kind involves a sense of recognizing kinship. Not panicking involves regulating one's emotions so you're not freaking out and tolerating anxiety rather than avoiding it. And some of the work involves finding meaning even in the awful stuff. Faith means recognizing things are right to be where they are, even if it's painful, and that we are all valid to be who we are. Most people communicate very well and a lot, and it's what you communicate that matters. If you want to learn more about me, you can head to zachbeach.com and learn more about the show at theheartcenter.com. Thanks again, Bruce. Thank you for having me. Thanks again for listening to the Learn to Love podcast. To learn more about the show and your host, head over to ZachBeach.com or TheHeartCenter.com. You can also follow Zach on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. 